So in 2002, knitters in at least two continents gathered on the streets to protest against global corporatism, and our message was being heard. So my stories today are going to be about communicating, not just to be heard, not just to have people understand what we say, but to have that turn into action, to have real change come about as a consequence of what we try to communicate. In trying to press our radical message of ending corporate rule in the world, the revolutionary knitting circles presented this in a way that challenged how people were associating activism in our communities and in our society. You know, the dominant image that was being presented in the, in the mainstream, in the corporate media, was extremely negative. You know, we had words that were quite polarizing and antagonizing and making people feel very wary and uncomfortable about the kind of changes going on. This is actual words from a local newspaper describing what we were trying to do in organizing protests. So when we held the Global Knit-In at the anti-G8 protests, it was really quite remarkable what came about from that. A friend of mine described what they had seen on TV when I talked to them the day after our protest, because there was a reporter reporting live from the scene. They, you know, they, during the news in the evening, they, you know, live from the scene at the protests. But what my friend said to me about what they were seeing in this reporter was, she was talking just like you, Grant. You know, when I get talking about political issues, I tend to more extreme views. And what was really interesting is contrasting that to what was being said about other protests. There were these things where people were talking about, you know, oh, hooligans and attacks and all this kind of very harsh, hostile, antagonistic language. And yet here was this thing where they, this reporter, this very mainstream reporter, was repeating what our actual message was about the need for local communities to be in control of their own means of subsistence. Not necessarily eradicating trade, but not being dependent on trade for our survival. Being independent, being able to take care of ourselves so that when corporations say, oh, we're going to impose genetically modified foods on you, we can turn around and say, no, we're not comfortable with that, we'll grow our own, thanks. A second thing that came out of that knitting circle experience was a number of years later, I was at a pesticide-free park party, and this woman came up to me, and she thanked me for the knitting circle, because I had been a key organizer behind that. And she said that during the G8, when there was all this tension and, and weirdness going on, she was really uncomfortable with what she was seeing in terms of the organizing around the protests and what was going to be going on with that. But then she heard about the knitting circle and was like, oh, that's something I could get involved in. And so she came out to the knit, and I didn't remember her, but there were a whole pile of people there, so I wouldn't remember who all was there. And she said that that was a way that was accessible to her, that she could get involved in this, because she was concerned about these issues, just not comfortable with what she was seeing with the protests. And what was interesting is it ended up serving as kind of a bridge drug into an ongoing practice of activism for her. She was still involved. She had come out and been a part of this community event working against pesticides in our communities. So there was a really substantive change there. And that speaks to what, for me, is the first point out of the experience with the knitting circle and about communication, is being welcoming. If we create welcoming spaces when we're trying to communicate, we're far more likely to be heard, as I experienced with the knitting circle. My second story is going to sound kind of tedious and boring in its topic. I was at a public committee meeting at City Hall where the topic was a policy proposal from city administration talking about the corporate naming of public facilities. Yes, that's, that was actually the topic. And for me, it was a fascinating one because I was and remain very concerned about the impact this has on our communities. In particular, in my work around issues with Sudan and immigrants from Sudan, refugees from Sudan, and the war going on there, I was very concerned that a local athletic center had been renamed for a company that had been accused of having ties to war crimes. I personally consider them guilty. I mean, the, you know, the, there are challenges in actually getting any sort of conviction or anything there. But that was a very deeply motivating thing for me. I have some very strong feelings about this. <laughs> <laughs> and what I would, you know, often do is go out and do protest bring my megaphone. Yes, I, I do have my own megaphone. Um, <laughs> that's it right there. You know, I could have gone out inside of City Hall and been like, you know. There must be no naming of public facilities after corporations. And you know, I have done some rallies like that. 
But on this day, what I did is I went in to this public committee meeting and took my five minutes, because you get you five minutes as a citizen to come up and speak on the issue. And what I said was this. I started off by saying, I'm personally opposed to any naming of public facilities after corporations. And I gave a few of my reasons why. And then I said, but I recognize that there will be some naming of public facilities and we're discussing a policy here to govern that process. So here are some recommendations I have for changes to this policy that I think would mitigate some of the concerns I have. What has made this story really interesting for me and something that I've thought about many times over the years since is that Craig Burroughs, who was a city councillor at the time and somebody with whom I have basically disagreed with on everything and was, you know, frankly quite glad when he was no longer on council. He took one of the things I suggested and moved it as an amendment to that policy. This was a, you know, totally clear evidence that I had been heard, that something had been communicated, not just been communicated to be understood, but communicated to make that change. Honesty and respect, I think, were the key things I want to pull out of that story. I wasn't dishonest with them. I didn't pretend I was on their side. I said, right from the start, I am opposed to any corporate naming. But then I respected them and the, where they were at by acknowledging, yes, this is going to happen. There will be naming of facilities. Here's what I suggest we do in that framework to mitigate some of my concerns. My final story is about a website I made, a fairly plain and unattractive website, but it conveys the information. This came out of the 2007 municipal election. A lot of my friends and family were asking me who they should vote for, because I'm very politically engaged and most people don't have the time to be anywhere near as politically engaged. Being kind of lazy, I was like, okay, I don't want to deal with this with every person who's asking me this, so I'll just set up a website. Both lazy and a computer geek, so it's <laughs> the kind of thing I do. What was particularly remarkable for me and what's changed my thinking about voter disenfranchisement out of this process was that in the week following that election, I had a couple people who said to me directly that the reason they voted at all was because of the information they were able to get through this website. And this was not a big complicated thing. I set it up partway into the election. You know, we were already a week or two in when I started doing it. It lists all the school board candidates, everybody, all their Facebook pages. And there wasn't Twitter at, active at the time, but there, I think there was some MySpace and YouTube and all that, and surveys that had been done. And that was enough to get people voting. You know, we, we talk about all these issues with voter disenfranchisement, get out the vote, rock the vote, all this kind of stuff. But really what I think is that people just need to have reasonable access to meaningful information. And that comes to my final point about participatory democracy, which is my goal here. I, I'm not actually interested in voting. I think voting is just a way of choosing a dictator. But <laughs> the, the way we get to participatory democracy it's not through jumping immediately to participatory democracy and telling everybody, oh, you're, you're terrible, you're anti-democratic because you elect representatives. It's how do we get people more engaged in their process now? And that is by making the information open and accessible to people, they will be more engaged. So out of these stories, being welcoming, being respectful, being honest and open. And while I've highlighted individual aspects of these in these stories, each of them had all of these very active in what I did. And those are what made it successful in terms of actually tangible change, which is such a rare thing in activism that it really sticks out in my mind and these stories will stay with me forever. And I hope what I've learned from this will stay with you and lead to action as well. Thank you.